Good morning, Missy O'Day. Kind of nice not all the porch to trip over today. But I find it a great joy just to come before all of you and be a witness to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Back in the 1800s, there was a man, a uh, great man. He, he witnessed an act of self, selflessness and kindness and love from a dying man. And it moved him so greatly that he vowed that every day, once a day, he would, he would say the name, bring the name of Jesus to somebody, even if it meant getting out of bed in the middle of the night. Uh, that man was uh, D.L. Moody. Uh, he went on to, in his life, to speak individually to over three quarters of a million people. He preached to over a hundred million people, and he saw the conversion of over a million people come to Jesus. If there ever was a witness that I'd want on one of my trials, <laughs> he would be the guy. It's just awesome. Uh, this morning, this reading, Lord, give me good eyesight. Uh, it comes from uh, Romans 10. Romans 10, uh, verses 8 through 15. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call to him. For everyone who calls on his name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they do not believe? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. May God bless the reading of his word. I like that last sentence, as it is written, that comes from Isaiah 52, 7, and the prophet uh, Nahum also mentioned those words. But last week, Scott had talked about Jesus washing the, the disciples' feet, and, and uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who spread the gospel. And I'm, it just made me think of how Jesus was washing their feet thinking that these are the feet that are going to go on to spread the gospel after his feet are nailed to the cross. It's, it's just amazing. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you are an awesome, loving, merciful God. You came to dwell amongst us. You came and sent your only son, Jesus, to die for us, to take our place to wash away our sins. Uh, this morning we pray that we could be great witnesses to this, not only with our hearts and with our mouth, but the way we act and live, that we become uh, believable witnesses to your life, Lord. And in his name we pray. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Jorgen, Lori, Addis, for leading us in music. That song that Jorgen wrote, Stand Firm, good song, huh? You know what I love about it is the emphasis is not how much we can hold on to God, but how much can God hold on to us. Do you think you're in good hands with God? Literally, figuratively, you're in good hands? Amen. Yeah, you are. So turn your Bibles to 1 Peter. comes just before 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at a few verses there. 
Uh, so the big news this week was the, uh, the, the Mega Millions jackpot. And uh, there's this guy out of New Jersey, 87-year-old guy who on Tuesday was like, I'm going to walk down to the convenience store. I'm going to buy my ticket and all my dreams will come true, right? Well, that day on Tuesday became not only his worst day, but also his best day. How could this happen? Well, on his way to the convenience store, he slipped and broke his hip. He then found his way to the hospital where he's in the hospital. He's talking to doctors and nurses. They're saying, describe to us what happened. He said, I'm on my way to the convenience store to buy my Mega Millions ticket. I slip and break my hip. And they just felt awful for this guy. And they said, tell you what, we've got an office pool going on here at the hospital. Why don't you you jump in on that? He said, I'd love to. That night... Five of six of their numbers were drawn. That pool won a million bucks. This guy ended up walking away with $7,000. And the hospital staff was interviewed the next day, and they said there was not even a, 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 a hesitation of us saying, why wouldn't we include this gentleman? Because we have a philosophy to bring joy and to bring hope to our patients. And wouldn't you know it, he ended up not only having the worst day of his life, but the best day as well. Isn't that awesome? So 141 of these people split a million-dollar prize. And this gentleman was a part of that group. Did he deserve it? No. Was he, did he have it on his radar that day? Not at all. And yet I think of that office there at that hospital, the, the staff of doctors and nurses, And the philosophy of why wouldn't we want to include others in on this? And the fact that this gentleman was a part of something, people he didn't even know, total strangers who were physically taking care of him, but also had an emotional and mental aspect to their their reaching out that they would include him in what they all didn't know was going to be a winning night. And I go, what a picture of the church. What a picture of the people of God That as as we go about this world, who are we picking up to be a part of something that we have this shared experience in? And and we don't have to guess, do we? The mega millions, you may win, you may not win. But with Jesus, everybody wins. And my call to you this morning, my, my plea to you is that We've got this office pool of excitement in Jesus going on. Why aren't there more people in in this, right? We've got this winning ticket named Jesus, guaranteed winnings in more ways than we can ever imagine. Who are we picking up to join us in this joy? There are people that are figuratively and literally stumbling about in the world. They are falling. They are breaking their hips. Their their dreams are being dashed. Their souls are being crushed. And we here in this place know what the answer is. Why aren't we including more into this pool? Amen? So this morning we get to talk about the discipline of witness. I didn't use the term evangelism because as soon as I say evangelism, some of us are like, ugh. Right? When you hear the word evangelism, what comes to mind? Open floor. What comes to mind? What is it? Billy Graham. Okay. That's a positive one. What is it? Are there still people that wear the sandwich board signs? The end is nigh. Dobson and Ray, they're not the ones just flipping it for lazy boy furniture, right? They're the ones out there saying, come to Jesus, repent. What else comes to mind when you think about evangelism? Tammy Baker. Now, some people don't know who that is. She's the poster girl for, for Revlon or, or <laughs> she was the overdone televangelist wife that you just thought Marge Simpson ain't got no hair on Tammy Faye Baker. You know what I'm saying? All right. What else comes to mind when you think about evangelism? Four spiritual laws. 
Learn the four spiritual laws, the laws. This way you can walk someone through the ways to get saved. What else comes to mind? Evangelism. This side, really quiet over here. Joel Osteen, knocking on doors. Has anyone ever knocked on your door to tell you about Jesus or God or something? Joseph Smith or whatever. See, here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to say that most of our experiences with evangelism tend to be negative. Tend to be negative. Whether you're on the giving end or whether you're on the receiving end. Maybe you grew up in a religious tradition that said you go out and you knock on doors. And you just ask people, hey, can I share with Jesus with you, right? And more often than not, that door just slams in your face versus getting a favorable reception. Maybe you're on the other end of things where people throughout your life just kept trying to preach Jesus to you. And maybe in the context of that, they were unloving or they weren't kind. Maybe they saw you as a project, not a person. I, we can run the gamut here this morning. My prayer is that God would reignite our hearts to understand how important witness is in our life. And I say witness because a witness is someone who's experienced an event. And once you've experienced that event, you tell people about what you've experienced. I think this is the heart of, a, of, of someone who's been changed by Jesus. Let me tell you who I've met, and let me tell you how it's changed my life. Now, you notice a word in your outline by the title of this message, a, a, a discipline of witness. What's the word in quotes? Sentness. So second, secondly, this morning, my prayer is that we would all discover our sense of sentness, meaning God has you being sent into this world every day. What is on your radar as you're being sent into the world? Because as you're going to see, the mandate for God on our lives is this. As the Father has sent the Son, the Son turns to His people and says, Now I send you. So we are going to rediscover our sense of sentness today. So you turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 3, and I'm going to hit you with a smattering of verses today, and I pray that God would do a work in our hearts for his glory and our good, and so that others may know the joy and hope that is found in Jesus Christ. You know, we live in, in such interesting times, and there's probably a lot that we either hear via the news or read via the news that would discourage us, and I'm going to tell you right now that perhaps we live in some of the most exciting times to share Jesus with others. Um, we are almost come full circle back to the first century where there are people who don't know who Jesus is today, surprisingly. You can sit down with students and show them a picture, you know, maybe a classic caricature of, of Jesus, and they don't know who that is. Or you can speak of Jesus and what he did on the cross, and they're like, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me about it? So some people would say that is, that's kind of a dismal type a scenario for our world, but I'm going to tell you these are exciting times to, to share Jesus. The problem is not that there's not opportunity all around us. The problem is God's got a reluctant army of people. And you know who they're called? The church. Called us. And, and, and when I say that, I'm going to tell you that I'm no master in my witness. There have been times I've been reluctant. As a pastor, you're thinking, this is what you get paid to do, right? Tell people about Jesus. Can I tell you, if I get on an airplane, I'm almost dreading who's going to sit next to me because I'm like, Lord, do I have to talk to him about Jesus? Honestly. Or I'm standing in line and someone's talking to me about this or that. I'm like, oh, Lord, this is just not the right time to talk about Jesus. And I'm sure in my reluctancy, you can also relate with just those times you're like, I just don't want to talk about Jesus now. And, and that's the human experience that we all share. And whether it be out of tiredness or laziness or whether it be out of fear, whatever reason, I pray that this morning we would discover that God is still building his church and he's using us as instruments to make that happen. And as you know about the Sozo Missio Dei deal, let me just give you a little bit of a, a background on this model of, of ministry. You know, here we are sitting in a, in a coffee house. And I actually met a woman last week who came, and she was from Oklahoma. 
She said, she came with a friend who lives here, and the friend said, hey, would you come to church with me? And she's like, sure. So they pull in last Sunday, and they pull into this parking lot, and she told me this after the service. She goes, I'm like, what, what are we walking into? Like, she sees big lots. She sees Sweetie's candy. She sees a furniture store. She's like, this is church. Like, the whole image of church is just kind of just blown away for her. And then she goes, we walked, and she goes, I went with it. We walked in. And then all of a sudden, it changed. She's like, there's no pews. There's no stained glass. There's no baptismal. There's, there, there's couches. There's seats. She goes, it felt like I was in someone's house. And the whole spirit just started to change for her. She's like, I love this. I love this. And again, we're, we're worshiping God in a coffee house. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to shatter the image of of what people perceive to be church. Not that a brick and mortar church building is wrong, but in a sense, I'm trying to deinstitutionalize the church and have it be more about people than it is a location. And so for this woman to walk in and experience that, I was just like, like in my mind, I'm going, mission accomplished. Like we are able to love on one another and express these, these concerns and these hesitations, and she feels comfortable to be here to talk through these things. This is why we started something like this. As a matter of fact, there's no name of Missio Dei, which is the name of the church on our, on our building. Why? Because, again, Missio Dei is not a destination. It's the people of, of God. What's on the building? Sozo Coffee. Sozo Coffee is now a vehicle that we pray God uses to build inroads into people's lives. As a matter of fact, the only advertisement for Missio Dei that there is, there's a little sign in the window right there. You see it? It's a little eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, nothing fancy. It gives the church name and says, hey, just so you know, there is a church that gathers here on Sundays two times on Sunday morning. You're welcome to join us. And people are like, that's it? Yes, you want to know why? Because it's less about getting people here and more about equipping you to be the church out there. Can I get an amen? Now, here's where some of you are going, but I'm not an evangelist. I'm going to tell you right now that there is the biblical gift or office of evangelists. But that doesn't mean that's our, you know, hall pass to say, I don't have to share my faith with anybody. I'm going to argue this morning that each and every one of us has a responsibility to share our faith. Just because you may not be an evangelist like Billy Graham or Luis Palau or whoever you may think of, we all have a responsibility to be ready to share the faith that we claim is within us. Amen? We get to do it all over the, t all over the place. And my prayer is this morning I will share with you stories of, of how that can happen. I want to equip you so that you feel more comfortable and confident to do that. And, and I'm going to tell you right now that with, even with the model of Missio Dei and Sozo and even thinking about the second location, right, and praying about that with, with James and Liz, the idea is, again, not about come and see. The idea, biblically, is to go and do. We're not building a come and see church. We're building a go and bless church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, Make sure your church attendance hits this much and you'll know you've achieved the work of God. Build this many square feet in your church building. I've, I've pastored a church where we were in 20,000 plus square feet of space. We had 100 people, 100 ministries with people involved in those ministries. And it was all about come and see. If there's anything you know about the spirit of Jesus, he went and went out and blessed. He went out and connected with people. Just like you've heard me say recently, if Jesus came back today, he would not come here. And I'm okay with that. He'd be out there loving the unlovely, loving the marginalized, loving the left out, lo loving the lost, loving the losers. He'd be out there loving them, not here with us. That's what I want for you, to go and bless. So faith is really less of a tell me kind of thing and more of a show me kind of thing. And you're going to hear that throughout the, the message this morning. 
The world does not want you necessarily to tell them you need to demonstrate or show them something. And that's why we started Missio Dei Sozo. It's because I wanted to embrace a different philosophy of connection with, with, with the world. And it's amazing the conversations, not only do I have with people, but with church leaders who come here and say, can I have some of your time because I want to find out more about your philosophy. Because I think the large mega church is slowly going the way of the buffalo. More and more generations as they come up are, are less likely to trust the institution and they're more to get involved in an organic movement where we are people and we talk and we love and there's something cool going on in that context. And again, I'm not saying the mega church is bad, but you were not designed to worship God in an entertainment type arena. You are called to worship God when we are living life organically one on one. Okay? You can slip into churches and slip out without connecting with anybody. You think that's worship? No, what I think it is is a check mark on your list of things to do on your fridge. I went to church, check, good. Now what do I got to do? Mow the lawn. Okay, and that's how we live our lives. But this, not that it's perfect, not that this is the end all be all, but what does this require? It requires us to get to know each other. It requires us to rub elbows with each other. It requires us to talk to each other. Oh, help us. Do I have to talk to that person? Yes. Because guess what? You may be spending eternity with them, and the person you're less likely to talk to may end up being your roommate in heaven. Get used to it. Wouldn't that be God's just ultimate, like, poetic justice in the kingdom? Like, the person you despise the most, you end up being in heaven with them, and they're your neighbor. Great. Can I borrow some sugar? You bet. Here we go. You see, all churches have a culture of, of evangelism. The question is, is it, a, is it a sick culture or is it a healthy culture? I am, I'm part of a movement where uh, I watched a video the other day, and the video sparked interest in me. It said, here's how to teach your people to evangelize. I was like, click play. I'm going to watch this. And basically the end of it was this. Let the professionals in the church do the work. You take an invitation card and just get your people in the seats on a Sunday. That's how you evangelize. And I was like, ah! <laughs> no, because we have done a disservice to the kingdom by letting the professionals do it. And in reality, none of us are professionals, but we're all people. and We've all got a testimony or story to share. You equip the people to do that. Share what you've experienced. Share what you discovered. Evangelism is not an invitation to church. It's not an invitation to church. It's not just giving somebody a Bible. Evangelism is not taking somebody to a crusade. It is so much more than that. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So first point is this. Point number one. You guys, we're in it for the long haul, right? This is three hours, all right? So you opted for the three-hour message, right? That's what the contract said. That's why I'm the professional, all right? Yeah, okay. Number one, our participation. We're going to go, go through this fast. Our participation. As I mentioned to you, we are all called to participate. But think about the biblical narrative. Here's, here's the Bible, right? God is on mission, number one. In the beginning, God, he creates the world, right? And there's only a short bit of time where things are perfect, things are not in disorder, things are not chaotic. And then all of a sudden, he creates man, and things radically change Genesis 3, right? If you want to think about the history of the world, think about it in four points. Number one, there's creation. Number two, there's fall. Number three, there's redemption. Number four, there's consummation. There's the history of the world in four words. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Now to put it a little bit more personably, think of it this way. There's God, there's man, there's Christ, and there's response. God sent his son. Why? Because of man's fallen condition. And through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, we can know joy and have eternal life if we respond to the invitation to accept him as Lord and Savior. God, man, Jesus, 
response. So God is on mission. Thank goodness that the Bible doesn't end in Genesis chapter 1. I mean, chapter 3, right? He seeks, he saves, and he does it because what? Jesus is on mission. Jesus is the agent of God's mission plan. And here's the cool thing about the, the name of this church, Missio Dei. If you've never, I, and I get it all the time from people. What does Missio Dei mean? What does Sozo mean? Missio Dei literally means God who is on mission. God is on mission right now. And what is he on mission to do? He is on mission to change your heart from hating him to loving him. To, from rejecting him to adoring him. That's what Missio Dei means. As God is on mission, he's come into the world, he sends his son, and as the, Jesus, like I said, has said to us, as the Father has sent me, now I send you. So now the church is on mission. We participate with God on mission. Isn't that awesome? Here, I'll give you a few verses. God on mission, right? Matthew chapter, uh, no, no, no. Let me, let me go back. Church on mission, three points. Number one, we are his witnesses. Number two, we are his missionaries. And number three, we are his ambassadors. Let me define each of these terms because these are each uh, worthy of, of giving you some verses and, and kind of spelling this out a little bit. And here's the heartbeat behind all this. Luke chapter 15, the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And Luke 15 is that passage that just shares with us the heartbeat of God, unlike some other sections of Scripture, because it says, you don't know how the, the kingdom of heaven rejoices over one lost person that is found. There's a party that is going on, and that is the spirit in which we get to participate with God. God uses us as part of his mission. So write down these verses. We are his witnesses. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Familiar passage, right? Jesus says to the disciples, go into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, realize this, and here's the encouragement, right? I'm with you until the end of the age. You're not going out alone. Thank you, Jesus, right? Now, it doesn't say go therefore and invite your friends to church. Uh, go, therefore, and give them a great book by that Christian author. Uh, go, therefore. No, no, you are involved in what? Making them disciples. Can you use those other things as tools in the process? Yes, but nothing is more important than your presence in somebody's life. Right? And so we go and we baptize and we teach them to observe what God has said. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. I like what he says here. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man. Oh, no, that's verse 5. Let's go to verse 15 real quick. Can we pull that up real quick, Paul? I probably wrote it down wrong. I'm sorry. Here's what Mark 16, 15 says. It says, you go out as witnesses, and you're proclaiming the kingdom of God. You're proclaiming something so fantastic, so wonderful, and you're letting people know about what God has done through Christ. Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Thank you, Paul, for dialing it up real quick. Give it up for Paul Terraberry. <laughs> Acts 1.8, Jesus, just before he departs and ascends to heaven, says to the disciples, what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Where? From Jerusalem to Samaria, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Basically, all over the world, you will be a witness to Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, a verse we looked at last week regarding our priesthood, that we're all priests in God's work, but look at the end of this. Why has God chosen you that you may proclaim, you're going to announce the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? Ladies and gentlemen, there is something remarkable that has happened in you. You now witness to that. Can I get a witness? Yes. We are his missionaries. Jesus says in John 20, 21, a verse I already re referenced to you uh, just a moment ago, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are the sent ones of God. 
And here's the good news. As you are being sent, the power lies not in your sentness. The power lies in the gospel message. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who, or everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember this, and we're going to come back to this, that the power of God saving people is not dependent on your sentness. It is based upon the power of the gospel message. And here's the cool thing, is that he has set that treasure in jars of clay. We are fallible people. We make mistakes. We are weak. We are frail, but the gospel is the message of God that he will use to transform lives. Can I get a witness? We are his ambassadors. Write down this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know what an ambassador is? It is someone on foreign soil that is a representative of another nation. And as Christians, as those who are saved by Christ, We are in foreign territory. This is not our world. The Bible says your citizenship is in heaven, right? Philippians chapter 3. Paul says this, and this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. What's that ministry? The ministry that we all have to help people be not only reconciled to God, but be reconciled to one another. Talk about a ministry, especially in divisive times like this, right? The fact that there are people sending bombs in the mail, and they're really not even that good bombs, so that's pretty horrible right there. People going into synagogues and killing people. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so many forces at, 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 that are working right now to tear this world apart. We, as believers in Christ, have this ministry of bringing people together to God and to one another. Amen? And Christ it was in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them entrusting to us the message of reconciliation therefore we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us we implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God God is using us to do his work. Is that not remarkable? And we are all given the power to do this. So our participation in God's work is tantamount. We have a responsibility to do what God has called us to do. And not any one of us is left out of this process. And again, I just, I I feel so strongly about this that we have left it to the professionals or we've left it to the evangelists and we don't go out and share the very hope that is within us. Well, that's going to change. Next point. Here we go. Number one, our proclamation. What is our proclamation? What is our, our announcement? Well, it is exactly what First Peter describes. Let's look at that passage. If you have it in your Bibles, uh, turn to First Peter 3. I want to show you this in context. Even though here's the verse I want to isolate verse 15. Let's look at it in context. 1 Peter 3, verse, starting at verse 8. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. To sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Now, just stop right there. Boy, if that was the spirit of our presence in the world, God would be, like, on the move. Amen? But unfortunately, we're not. But Peter wants to correct this. Now, Peter has written to a church, a group of churches. They were going through one hell of a time. They were being beaten. They were being persecuted. This is a church that's suffering for their faith. So Peter writes to them and encourages them to stand stand firm. Look what he says, verse 9. Not returning evil for evil, (coughs) insult for insult, (coughs) giving a blessing instead. When someone insults you, you bless them. How's that sound? Doesn't sound like the policy of some people I know. For you were called, you were saved for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. 
Let him who means to live life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Notice this. And those and who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. He is your anchor. He is your rock. He is your refuge. He is your fortress. He is the one who is unstoppable, un un unconquerable. Sanctify this Lord whom you say you believe in. Sanctify him. Live in holiness. Adore him and gaze upon him like you've never gazed upon him before. See him and savor him. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. Meaning, your proclamation is going to come about because you are living a questionable lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to live a questionable lifestyle. Some of you are like, huh? Shaggy? <laughs> Questionable living is this, the type of living that elicits questions from people, what makes you different? Because I'll tell you what, the world may not understand the word Jesus. They may not understand the word gospel. They may not understand the world, word salvation. They, they may not even understand the Bible. But here's what the world does understand. They understand pain. They understand suffering. And when they see you, they go, your marriage seems to be doing okay. My marriage is hell. Please tell me what's your hope. And you've lost your job, and I'm going through perhaps a job loss, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Please tell me, how did you survive your job loss? Because I'm losing hope. And my kids seem to be rebelling against me, and your kids seem to be okay, even though they, my kids rode down the street in our neighborhood. And I remember one time years ago, one of my kids yelling out, you know, let my people free. Like for some reason, that was like the call of the neighborhood that morning. And they're going, oh, great. There's those Christian kids again, right? And my kids aren't perfect. I love them and I adore them. But you know what? There's people going, I don't know what to do with my kids. It seems like you've got something going on. Can you tell me, please? Because I'm losing hope in my family. See, people may not come to you and ask you, what are the four spiritual laws? What's the meaning of life? Can you please tell me what Jesus' vicarious substitutionary atonement means? They may not ask you these things, but doggone it, if you're living life as the one who has sanctified Christ as Lord in your heart, people are going, you have hope. I don't talk to me. And if no one is asking you questions, perhaps you haven't sanctified Christ as Lord in your heart. You in Christ are different. You in Christ are countercultural. You in Christ are set apart. You in Christ are salt. You in Christ are light. Who is asking you about that? Because the promise, I believe, is this. As you sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, people are going to ask you questions. And I'm not asking you to give them a, a, a canned response. I'm not asking you to, to ram something down their throat. You know what gavage is? You ever heard the term gavage? I was listening to this NPR. Yes, I know. I, I love Jesus when I listen to NPR. Can you imagine that? They were talking about how foie gras is made. You know, foie gras is it's, it's fatty duck liver. They ram a tube down a duck's throat and bloat the liver and the insides of the duck 600 times the normal size. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how people feel when you barrage them with the gospel. You have gavaged me. Please leave me alone. No one wants it rammed down their throats, Right? But there is a time to proclaim. 
There's a time to talk. Can I, can I tell you? Within the past couple years, there's been, there's been these amazing conversations. There's two guys. I, 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 pl- I play poker. I don't go to the casino, but I do hang out at sports bars and play poker. And I've had an amazing opportunity just to rub elbows with people and talk to people and share Jesus with people. Drunk, sober, everything in between. And there's two guys that have come out of that relationship through these, these poker circles. Actually, I'm hosting a poker charity tournament on November 11th here. If anyone's interested, let me know. I'll, 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 I'll connect you. You get to brush elbows with a lot of heathens, a lot of pagans. Who's, who's in? Yeah, this is, is going to be fun, all right? So James is there. We love doing that kind of stuff, especially when we win their money. That's a lot of fun. Please tell me the hope that's in you that you stole my buy-in for poker, all right? So these two guys came forward. One is an atheist and one is a Muslim. Both of them initiated conversations with me. First was this atheist. And listen, we love atheists. We welcome atheists. Matter of fact, someone, when they turned in their serving card last week, remember we did the serving thing? Someone didn't check anything and just wrote at the top, total atheist. I thought, you are welcome here. So if you wrote that, you're loved, just so you know. Maybe it was James. Were you just being sly, like total, or pentagram, Satan worshiper, right? We, we, We love all people. So this atheist basically said, can we get together and talk? I got a lot of questions. Pain, suffering. The cross, doesn't the cross seem foolish? I said, it does. As a matter of fact, the Bible says you're going to go out there and the world's going to look at you and you go, they're going to go, you're weird. Because the cross is foolish to those who are perishing. So this man and I sat for an hour plus, And with gentleness and respect, I let him lead with the questions and we were able to dialogue through this. At the end, he wasn't converted. Aww. I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. But he stood up. He says, I love you, brother. And I want to do this again. Second man, Muslim, from North Africa, called me and he said, and this was a couple years ago, he says, I'm really experiencing difficulty with people that I work with because they don't understand me being raised a Muslim. They tend to be more the American Christian persuasion And uh, I just have some questions about what do Christians believe? And he initiated this, and we got together, and for a couple hours, he just asked me one question after another. And I was able to point out the the gospel truths and the the message of Jesus, and he just was like, he goes, these were things never taught to us in my culture growing up. But I'm glad you were available to talk through these things with me. And I said, let's do it again. Right? Right? Three things we need to understand when it comes to sharing. First is relate is uh, refined terms. Let's talk about this. Refined terms. These terms tend to get misused and botched and misunderstood. The terms are these: evangelism and gospel. What is evangelism? Simply put, it is sharing the gospel with the aim to persuade. It's not the aim to argue. It's not the aim to debate. It's not the aim to gavage people. It's the aim to persuade. We're going to talk about persuading here in a moment. So write down that definition if you would. I didn't give you the whole thing because I didn't want you sleeping. So you need to write in where it says dot, dot, dot. There's more to it, okay? Sharing the gospel with the aim to persuade. That's evangelism. What is the gospel? Glad you asked. The gospel is the joyful message from God that leads us to salvation. It is the joyful, the good news, right? The joyful message from God that leads us to salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been here for any amount of time, you know that Christ is front and center, whether we're doing communion, whether we're singing songs. We proclaim that Jesus has died, that he has given his life for us, He has taken our place. He has risen from the dead. And in his rising from the dead, he has overcome death and sin and brokenness. And he brings new life to all those who put their trust in him. That's the gospel. That's joyful. That makes me do this and smile and get up every morning. Right? Not that you have to. This doesn't make you a Christian, just so you guys know. But the good news is a joyful news. Amen? 
So we need to refine the terms. Let's not overcomplicate it, but let's simplify it. Evangelism is sharing, and the gospel is the good news, the joyful message. Point number two, but we do it with a respectful tone. Notice 1 Peter 3, verse 15. You do this with gentleness and respect. Someone once said, what, once you cut off a person's nose, there's no point in giving them a rose to smell. Right? The gospel will do its work. Don't make it any more difficult by being obstinate, by being debative, by being argumentative, by being rebellious, by boycotting this, boycotting that. It is unfortunate what evangelicalism has become in our culture. But we get the opportunity to win it back. Evangelicalism is not pro-Trump. Evangelicalism is not pro-Israel. If you are, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. But too many times in our culture, when they hear evangelical, they automatically associate with politics or bringing in this new legislative morality, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the opportunity to win it back. And it is this. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ no matter what end of the political aisle you're on. Amen? Do you believe that there's Democrats who love Jesus? I do. I know it's hard for some of you, but I do. Yeah. So we need to be passionate without being mean. We need to, to go out there and tell people that there is something that is within me that I just am bursting with joy to share with you. Because evangelism requires affection. And I wonder if today, as was true 100, 200 years ago, like with, when um, um, the, the guy, uh, Frederick, um, God is dead, we've killed him. Nietzsche. He said, I will believe in your redeemer when you start looking more redeemed. Meaning, how are we to proclaim something that maybe we just don't feel that passionate about? And I'm not saying you got to go run down the street saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. No, no, no. We're not talking about loony Christians, okay? But we are talking about people where their hearts are full of Christ that it can't help but come forth that they are joyful and passionate about him. Jesus himself said that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are you, what are you proclaiming? What are you sharing? See, we don't need to develop a strategy for connecting with people. We just need to find opportunities to share the joy that we have in Christ. Because I want people to know God, His glory, His Son. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? So we do it with a respectful tone. Lastly, and we must be results-tempered. Meaning this, your goal is not to save anybody. Can I say that again? You're, matter of fact, let me say it another way. You cannot save anybody. But you can share the gospel with people. You can share the joyful message with people. Let God be busy with the results, and you just be obedient in sharing. How's that sound? Too many of us, seriously, we are defeated if we walk away from a conversation that person didn't sign the contract to accept Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's been so many. I've failed more than I succeeded if you're results oriented. Let's get really honest. Jesus failed. Je I was thinking about leading this message by this. Jesus was a failure. How many people approached Jesus, they talked about eternal life, and they left without accepting him as Lord? Was Jesus a failure? Not at all. See, we have to leave the results up to God. Don't treat people like projects. Treat them as people and trust God to do the inner work that you are powerless to do. Write down these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says this, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul is saying God can use any method necessary. This is not about how persuasive you are, how argumentative you are, how well and how eloquent you speak, but the work of God is based upon the demonstration of his spirit. Amen? Next chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here's what Paul says. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Look at that one more time. 
I planted, Apollos watered. They're used, participating, but who's causing the growth? God. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Amen? That's good to remember. And Ecclesiastes 11, 6, there's, six, there's nothing like drawing upon the cynic Solomon, right? He said this, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening with, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Literally, you go out, you sow liberally, and you just leave the results up to something beyond you. Can I get a witness? Yeah, all right. Number three, our persuasion. I told we were going to circle back to this. We are called to be persuasive people. Now, I'm almost sounding contradictory because I just told you it's not in persuasion that people are saved. But let me define this according to Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at these verses. What is Paul describing here in verses 11 through 15? Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Knowing what? The fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Persuasiveness is not manipulation. Persuasiveness is being so captured by the wisdom and knowledge and glory of God, it comes out, but what we are uh, is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So you notice where the focus is, the person and work of Christ. And that message is the message we lead with. And so it is our persuasion that we seek to love others with pure motives and not with the manipulative spirit, with deep conviction of truth, we tell people about Christ. Now the question is, why do we not share with people or try to persuade them? Two reasons. Number one, there's fear. And number two, isolation. I mean, let's be honest. The two major categories that I seek to, that I want us to kind of overcome. Number one is fear. Many of us don't know what to say, right? What if, what if they ask me about this? What if they ask me about that? There's an amazing verse, and I'm blanking right now. Luke, where Jesus says, when you stand on trial, don't be concerned about what you're going to say. Trust the Spirit to give you what you need to say at the moment. And I want to say it's Luke 12, Luke 13. We fear because we don't want to be rejected. We fear because we don't want to look stupid. We fear because we don't want to make pe people awkward, like that Jim Gaffigan joke, right? Just walk into any party at a time and say, can I tell you about Jesus? There's a party poopy spirit right that happens at that moment. But there's also the fact that we live in isolation. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it true that we sometimes just like to retreat into the Christian subculture? And we just don't want to brush elbows with people who are not Christians. So we listen to only Christian music, we watch only Christian movies, and we hang out with only Christian people. You know what that's like? It's like a big pile of fertilizer. You know what happens when you have a big pile of fertilizer in one place? What does it do to the ground? It burns it. Fertilizer is not meant to be heaped up in the burn, but to be spread out and to do good and cause growth. Amen? Did he just call us poop? Maybe I did but I did it with gentleness and respect, okay? We find the lifestyles of unbelievers offensive. <gasps> They're sinning. That's what sinners do. They cuss. I don't know if I can be around them. They said words that were offensive to my hearing. When you don't know Jesus, that, when you know Jesus, sometimes that's what you do. Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness? You know what I'm saying? Ladies and gentlemen, people who don't know Jesus don't do things that honor Jesus. Have we been in this world this long that we forget this? 
people do stupid things, they say stupid stuff, and or we're just too busy with ministry, ironically. Yeah, we've got no time. I pastored a church where I had a church office, I had a church desk, I had a church secretary, and I was just busy with church people all day. I had to get out of there, and I would go get my hair cut three times a week just to have conversations with people that weren't Christians. Seriously, like, are, are we that afraid of, of the culture that we isolate ourselves? Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we are living in some of the most exciting times. Great opportunities to talk about Jesus. You may not know all the answers. You may not have every response. But the fact that you're engaging is key. How do we engage three, three ways? We persuade in our living. We persuade in our loving. And we persuade in our listening. So I'm going to teach you how to be a better liver, lover, listener. Liver, back to that gavage thing again, right? I'm going to teach you how to be foie gras. That sounds delicious, doesn't it? Yeah, disgusting. Okay. And can I tell you, as I talk about living, we live in a context where perhaps it's more demonstration than proclamation. There's this donut company in Japan called Mr. Donut. Anyone familiar with Mr. Donut? Well, years ago, if you wanted to start a Mr. Donut franchise in Japan, you entered this training period which required you daily as a manager of a new location to go about the surrounding neighborhood in which you were going to start your store and offer to clean people's toilets. Is that awesome? Some of you are like, oh, I'm glad that's not part of our culture here, right? Like in Japan, they saw that you were to be gracious and to show thankfulness and a healthy sense of self-respect by going out, not only in starting your business by cleaning other people's toilets, but once a year you continued that blessing to the community where you would go knock on their door and say, I'm the owner of the Mr. Donut franchise. I'm here to clean your toilet. But the message is implicit and clear. Those who serve others gain a hearing for the gospel. Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. See, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world that is tired of us talking and they want to see us demonstrating. And we hold those two things in tension. It's not all demonstration and no proclamation. It's not all proclamation and no demonstration. There's some places in the world where you need to proclaim. Deep Hindu India, we went about years ago preaching Christ in these places where they saw a lot of demonstration, a lot of nonprofit charities and organizations come in and do wonderful do good deeds and kind acts of service, but they needed to hear that Christ is Lord and the only God, even in the midst of their 33 million gods. But in our culture, the culture has gone deaf because they don't want to hear you scream at them anymore about Jesus. They want you to demonstrate the servanthood, spirit, and love of Christ. Tertullian. Imagine naming your kid that. That's an awesome name, right? First century, here's what Tertullian said. As he wrote the Roman authorities, he wrote this letter as a Christian. He said this, we live in the world with you. We do not forsake forum or bath or workshop or inn or market or any other place of commerce. We sail with you. We fight with you. We farm with you. See, Tertullian wrote during a period where the Romans saw Christians as atheists. The Christians were the atheists because they despised the pagan gods. And Tertullian wanted those authorities to know, we live among you. And we are here to love you. And that's why another emperor, Julian, was amazed by the Christian love that was being outpoured to the people. And Julian said to his people, the only way we can crush Christianity is to outlove them. Well, guess what happened? That didn't happen. There was so much love being poured out from the Christians that they took over the Roman Empire, hence Constantine and the institutionalization of the Christian church in 300 AD. We live in a world where we give opportunities to showcase the gospel. Less in our words and more in our deeds. Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Look at this. But when I say that their conduct, living, behavior, I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. 
This means that there is a way we live our lives that is in step with the gospel. This is why I pray for me and you, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, that we walk in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ. Because your walk and your conduct is so critical in gaining a hearing in our culture for Jesus. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, the idea that, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, talks about the aroma of Christ being everywhere, one is a fragrance from death to death, the other a fragrance from life to life. Like, how stinky or how good smelling are you? Right? How's your stink? How's that, how's that for an opening question when you meet another? How's your stink today? Is it good or is it awful? The aroma of Christ is going out. And we are a part of hopefully making it a pleasing aroma. Amen? So as you live among people, as you engage people, You go about and you do good. You you bless them. Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. You are salt. You are light. You are like a city set upon a hill. And you have opportunity to live this way. Why? Because they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? It means somehow you make an impression on someone's life through the way you live. Ladies and gentlemen, living for Christ does not embrace what I call a hit-and-run evangelism. You know what that is? When I first became a believer when I was a teenager, when God saved me, you know what I used to do? I used to have New Testaments, little tiny New Testaments in my car, and I'd drive down the, str- uh, the street, and there would be like a couple Mormon guys. I'd huck a New Testament at them and be like, seek the true Jesus and drive off. I'd come to a stoplight. Someone's in a pickup truck. I'd throw a Bible in their back of their car. Seek Jesus now, right, and take off. We do that, right? Like we go to the neighbor's house around Christmas. Here's some cookies. Here's the Bible. Right? There's there's no engagement. There's no living with people. Ladies and gentlemen, do not embrace an evangelism that is impersonal and void of risk. What I'm talking about is risky, but it's risky in a good sense. You get to connect with people like they've never been connected before. You get the opportunity to change their perception, not only of the church, but of Christians. Number two, in our loving. Like I mentioned before, Julian, who is this emperor, he commanded the the Romans, you have to outlove the Christians. But without Christ, there's no way you can outlove the Christian. So how are you doing in loving? Notice what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says at the very beginning. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Stop right there. Paul is telling us, don't look at people through your prejudices, through your own perceptions and preconceived notions. You need to view people as God views them them you want to know how you love people you love people regardless of skin color you you love people regardless of sexual orientation you love people regardless of their their political leanings you love people because all men and women are created in the image of god and deserving of dignity and respect period full stop you don't love someone to convert them from being homosexual to straight You don't love somebody to convert them from being a Democrat to Republican or the other way around. You love people simply because Jesus has come to show love to you. And what kind of wretched person with you? Let's not start there. We'd be here all for eternity. Amen? You go and you love. And what was required is a gospel view of people. That no matter what, How you spin it, we are all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, as you have been loved, you go love. People don't necessarily remember what they're told about God's love, but they'll never forget when they experience God's love. Love is the greatest apologetic. 
and my wife is having a laughing moment over there. Are you laughing in the spirit right now? Oh, <laughs> you are? Okay, good. Love is the most powerful apologetic. Love God and love others. I just called my wife out who can barely talk. And you know what? You go out and you bless people. You love them. You bless them because you've been blessed and you bless them with no strings attached. That's hard to do, isn't it? To love people like that. I remember the, 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 the man who founded modern day Kenya. One of his most sobering quotes was this. He said, the Western culture came and they taught us to pray with our eyes closed. And when we opened our eyes, we had a Bible, but they had our land. And I think how many view Christians in that spirit? Like, is, is this a bait and switch kind of relationship you're having with me right now? Like, you're offering me something, but what are you going to take from me? And they don't know what 100% selflessness looks like from evangelicals. They don't know what it looks like just to be loved unconditionally as they are where they are. And all I know is I've been loved like that. I want to extend that love to others. In our listening, number three. We're going to wrap this up soon. We have to, huh? Because it's almost lunchtime. Oh, Lord, we got to get going. Corinthians, uh, Colossians chapter four. In our listening. Can I just tell you, James one, I, I, I quote this with my boys all the time. Be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to get angry. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. James 1 verse 19. Here's what Colossians says. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Questionable living, yes, because they're asking you. And you are, person by person, giving an answer according to the hope within you, right? But notice what this requires. It requires you paying attention because not every person gets the same answer. Amen? Every person will share different things with you, and they'll be wrestling with different circumstances, and you are not called to come along with a canned response, Jesus is Lord. Right? Whether it be marriage or work or kids or whatever, we need to understand every single person's individual struggle or pain or, or difficulty and ask God for the wisdom to speak into that. The great Francis Schaeffer, a great Christian mind in the 60s and 70s, was asked the question, if you were given an hour with somebody who was a non-believer, what would you do? He said, I would listen to them for 55 minutes and then give them an answer in the last five minutes. How you guys do with that? Are you like me? You've got, you've got this whole argument thing built up. And as soon as someone says one word, you're like, wow, I got a great answer for that. And you're just like, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, well, great. Thanks for listening to me. Listen. Pay attention. The woman at the well, John 4, Jesus knew how to de navigate that conversation as she was leading the conversation, but Jesus always found a way to bring it back to himself. Amen? Whew. Let's stop there. You guys have had enough. Can I just tell you in closing, take out that insert that you have in, that, in your uh, program. Here's the practice. Let me, let me just give you some homework. Uh, I stole this from a guy named Michael Frost really cool guy who understands like this idea of being sent in a missional mindset. Notice there's five, five lifestyle imperatives I would love for each of you to embrace that I myself do my best to embrace and I have found some amazing opportunities to just share Christ. It follows the acrostic bell b-e-l-l-s number one bless i will bless three people this week at least one of whom is not a member of our church or any church meaning who will you love what three people will you love this week 
unconditionally and just bless them. Maybe mow their lawn, maybe babysit their kids. Uh, um, Who will you bless in some way so that the spirit of generosity grows in you and uh, one of those people needs to be someone who doesn't know Christ? Who will that be? Number two is this. Eat. How many meals do you eat a week? (laughs) Now, the normal person eats about 21. I have the spiritual gift of eating. I eat about 30, but just just kidding. I will eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a member of our church, meaning not a believer. Who will you go out to lunch with and listen to? This is the spirit of hospitality that is built within that we're eating already. Folks, none of us go without a meal, (laughs) especially for 21 meals. Who will you invite to the table? Because here's the miracle of of eating. The Gospels tell us Jesus came to do three things. He came to save, he came to serve, and he came to eat. Literally, the Son of Man came. Type that in, three things. Save, serve, and eat. This is why we created Sozo. People are drinking coffee. They may as well drink it here. And then we get the idea, the, the, the opportunity to talk to them. Who will you go out to a meal with or invite over so that you can get to know them? You can find out about them. Number three, listen. I will spend at least one period of the week listening for the Spirit's voice. Meaning a time to get away and just get away from the clutter, get away from the clamor, get away from the distraction, and just go. Take a pad and paper, a uh, pen with you, take a, take a device, turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your ringer, and just listen. What is God telling you? We're going to talk about this more later on when we talk about silence and solitude. And I give everyone their monk robe, right? Yeah, exactly. Number four, learn. I will spend at least one period during the week learning Christ. Meaning going into the Gospels and paying attention to the spirit of Jesus, the character of Jesus. How did he respond to that person? How did he respond to that other person? If we're not learning Christ, we're not going to live Christ. And number five, sent. I will journal throughout the week about the ways I have alerted others to the universal reign of God through Christ. This is growing more missionally. Meaning... God is doing something. How will you keep track of the conversations you've had? And when you write it down, you're committed to pray for those people. Because while they may not accept Christ at that point, they may accept him on your 70th interaction with each other. Amen? So I gave you guys a lot. You You guys are strong. You can handle I knew you could handle this. Go out and live as the sent people of God. God wants to use you, he wants to work through you, and he wants Christ to be exalted. I think I've given you enough. Maybe if you have some questions, write it down in your comment card. Maybe we'll tackle them later. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the reminder. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me for either selfishness or fear or empathy or, or, or uh, apathy or or arrogance lord there's there's so many things that prevent any of our hearts from sharing christ lord do battle with those things so that christ is apparent whether it be in word or deed lord be glorified in our lives Give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with others. Lord, thank you for allowing us to participate with you on your mission to seek and save those who are lost. Lord, thank you again for being our God, for for pursuing us and shedding a love upon our lives that we've never, ever experienced before. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you, may he keep you, may he lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right?
Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.